Howdy. Um, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about security. Shocking, coming from me, um, uh, in, in the, the DevOps uh, for the Mac people. Um, some of this will be, you know, um, uh, DevOps, it, it, it can be a little generic as far as like things you do, you do pretty much anywhere, uh, whether or not you're in a Mac environment or something else. But um, hopefully everyone picks uh, up a little bit here. Um, I'm an R&D engineer for Dura Security. Um, I, uh, I guess I could call myself um, um, a recovering Mac admin at this point, only I'm still doing a lot of Mac admin stuff, so um, it's kind of like the best of both worlds. Uh, I get to participate, um, yet not struggle with Adobe. So <laughs> it's just oh, it's all it's all win-win. Um, real quick bio, uh, in case this is the first time you see me speak. Um, I was a Mac admin for about 15 years, um, worked pretty much small, large, enterprise uh, higher ed, um, and I wrote some open source tools. Um, and like I said, um, R&D engineer now, which basically means I break Macs for profit. Um, and that hopefully uh, helps to protect our customers in uh, some way. And also I try to contribute uh, findings back to the community as, as much as possible to uh, help everyone you know, do better. Um, you can find me on Slack, Twitter, GitHub, um, host on the Mac Admins podcast as well. Shout out to all the, uh, everyone who listens to that, by the way. Do we do this for a reason? All right, look, hands. Tom, Tom listens, so you should definitely listen. <laughs> nice. No, you're listening to me right now. Nice, gotcha. All right, so talk, let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, kind of the problem that we're uh, going to address here today. Um, so we're talking, this is sort of in the, the, the framework of, you know, what can you do if you do anything in Mac DevOps or DevOps in general to not make your company, you know, reach the headlines. Um, and uh, I have a couple of, um, you know, rough uh, numbers here. Uh, this is from the Verizon data breach uh, report. Um, the 2016 one came out. Um, I didn't update it yet because they kind of like change their, their focus every year and these numbers I think are still pretty uh, representative of, um, of what goes on out there. So um, you will be shocked to, to learn that 95% of breaches invo involve some kind of compromised credentials. I'm sure we all you know, hold on to our credentials here and have no idea how that could happen, but it turns out that credentials are really easy to get to. And 75% um, of those breaches are uh, actually through endpoints. So whereas you might think like, well, you know, a lot of these attacks are servers and you know, systems that I have no control over. Um, not so. Endpoints actually a very interesting uh, target for that. And 26% of those uh, involved printers. And you may think, say what now? Printers? Um, so let's do a quick, uh, a quick branch here and look at um, uh, something that recently uh, was published by a, um, um, a PhD student, I believe he's from Germany, uh, who did a lot of research on um, a printer. Uh, exportation, what you can do with printers that are on your networks to get some kind of foothold on a network and do, you know, things that are probably not uh, uh, very legitimate. Uh, he wrote a very nice uh, printer exploitation toolkit that you can get on GitHub that uh, will, uh, uh, you know, uh, have, uh, be able to use a whole myriad of uh, printers out there on your network to see if you have anything uh, vulnerable and possibly um, inject uh, some code in there to get a foothold that you might not find out about unless you actually know that your printers are vulnerable and you might have a presence that has nothing to do with endpoints or servers or anything like that. Uh, it is just a printer that generally has a, you know, some kind of hard disk for storage uh, that you can put some malware on. So just to give you an idea of like the breadth of all of this, printers are also vulnerable. So now everyone goes home and sets fires to their printers. <laughs> um, so let's get back to the uh, matter at hand here. So. Um, little graph here, kind of give you an idea of like uh, attacks, where attacks targets have gone over the, the last couple of years. Um, and as you can see, more and more, the user device and the person are more and more a target for those who uh, wish to do us um, uh, some kind of uh, harm in some way. Um, and uh, server attacks sort of on the, on the decline, which I think is probably in line with what we've seen as of late. Um, any attack that is out there is kind of targeted at people directly versus um, larger scale uh, attacks, um, notwithstanding uh, research of, you know, uh, uh, going after servers, uh, services leaking metadata, like the, uh, the example we got with the mod status in Apache. Um, and why is this done? Again, not shockingly, financial gain. 
turns out we uh, we like to get financial gain. Uh, uh, espionage, uh, I, I think, is uh, is in the uh, <clears throat> in the spotlight a little bit more these days too. So um, that said, um, so are we saying basically like is the user at this point the 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 the, the spear, uh, you know sort of the 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 um, the most vulnerable uh, vulnerable point in the system? And um, I think you probably can say that it, this is true. The end user and the endpoint are the most vulnerable at this point out there. Um, which is not concerning at all, I'm sure, because we have full control over what our users do, even if those users are ourselves in a DevOps environment. Um, we all do perfect, right? We have our security. Yes, okay, good. So then, anyway. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the threats that are out there, right? The, the, the general categories here. So we got credential theft. Um, I think you know, we, we have uh, good visibility to that, malware, APT, all that fun stuff that gets on, a, on an endpoint and then attacks on the server themselves, which for what we're talking about DevOps here is uh, a not insignificant um, uh, target still. So which of these three should we all worry about? I think you probably all know the answer, which is, you know, um, basically all of them. Um, because they all have some sort of in, you know, impact on what we do uh, if we're working in, in, in a DevOps environment, whether we are a programmer using these services, managing these services, or reliant upon them in some other way. Um, again, the source of a lot of these attacks, mostly, you know, uh, by and large, uh, external external threats. Um, there's obviously internal threats as well, um, but generally speaking, I think we will... Um, you know, focus more on external threats, even though the, some external threats may may pose as being internal, but actually being in, uh, externally uh, externally sourced. Um, so, some examples of, of of you know credential credentials being being vulnerable. Um, obviously, there is the the bypass category where your system is just not set up very well, or it has a vulnerability where someone can simply uh, sidestep whatever. Uh, Credentials, and I'm using that very broadly as whether it's a user authentication or a authentication token or anything like that. Um, you can just sidestep it. Um, uh, you know, even some systems will offer a, a multi-factor authentication, but there's a vulnerability, and you can just simply sidestep that and never even have to use that. Um, brute force. Always fun, of course. Um, in, in this day and age, um, we have access to a, quite a bit of uh, computing power, and in certain instances, it, it's pretty. Uh, uh, doable to actually just brute force something. Obviously, um, um, this is why we do complex, unique passwords for everything um, to make that harder to do. Um, um, use of O-Days. Um, I'll, I'll touch on this later, but unless you are like a really big shop, like a Google or Facebook or someone else, uh, someone might not be interested in using that against you, but at the same time, you might be very, very small and very specific. You might be a let's say, a, um, uh, a researcher or a, a privacy advocate uh, somewhere in a country where that is not appreciated and someone may end up using something called Pegasus or Trident against you, which ultimately was used against one or two persons, but it was very important that those people got actually breached and, and, and their data got stolen. So it's, it's sort of like either very much you know, spear phishing or very much a large org and trying to get get you know uh, get in there um, or no credentials, obviously like IoT we all know the S in IoT stands for security. Um, this is sort of the same thing. Uh, no credentials. Uh, you probably be a little scared to see how much on no credential services out there. We'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, and then there's the credential exposure, which is sort of like a second second step after. Uh, if the, the credentials can't be bypassed, uh, phishing. Uh, who here does n has never heard of phishing? Good, so that says something about where we are at this point. Everyone knows about phishing and spear phishing and all the, uh, the various uh, things there, touching on a little bit. Uh, insecure storage, storing your credentials somewhere where someone can easily get at it, um, and, or having default settings. Again, uh, lots of IoT out there that, or, or Wi-Fi routers for that matter, that do not get, get their credentials changed because, hey, I plugged it in and it works, so moving on. Um, again, sort of, some numbers here about uh, uh, compromised uh, credentials. How are they gotten? Um, use of stolen cred, so hacking in some way, uh, malware that, that grabs data and, and, and exports uh, credentials somewhere, uh, command and control, malware. Uh, phishing, still uh, in the top five there. 
and then any kind of like spyware or keylogger that will actually physically grab the password or credentials as, as a user types them in. Um, so how does that relate to what we do in DevOps, right? Like what credentials are there to get from us? You might, you know, think of some, but it's actually, it's, I'm just giving sort of an overview of like things that came to my mind Im immediately. So any kind of version control system, right? If you use Git or Fab or HD or whatever, Mercur Mercurial. Um, if someone has credentials to get to those, that would be probably bad, right? Like someone can pull code or commit code or do stuff with your code. That's probably not great. Um, in this you know, day and age, AWS, GCP, um, we're all hosting something in the cloud, even if it's you know, for smaller projects. Um, Docker, um, you need credentials for that. Uh, I know they, all these projects work on you know, implementing TLS and other, other things, but they definitely, if you want to, still allow you to use pretty weak or you know, non you know, sub-secure standards, I guess, of, of uh, authenticating. And it's often easy to start something up and then kind of forget that you should strengthen, you know, harden this later and you kind of leave it and then you know, the things go, go wrong. Um, if you have any kind of VM infrastructure, again, you get the idea. SSH, PKI, wikis, uh, any kind of logging infrastructure you have, you might have you know, a, a, you know, a um, elastic, um, sorry, spacing out. Um, uh, what's that? Elk. Elk, sorry, yeah, some kind of stack. Again, credentials, so the cloud, basically. It requires a lot of credentials these days because they all want us to uh, think of ourselves. So all this phishing, we know what it is, obviously, so I'm just doing a quick crash course in what phishing is about. So um, usually it starts with an email that comes from someone that you may or may not know or it may purport to be from someone you know um, and say, hey, I, um, I have some email from so-and-so person. Um, sure, send along. Um, has some kind of phishing content, content whether it's, uh, you know, click here or um, email me back with your credentials. These days, you know, um, if you are an email uh, systems administrator, uh, I would say um, you might want to not run your own, just like rolling your own crypto at this point. Like, don't roll, run, uh, run your own and, you know, set up your things like uh, your DMARC uh, records and all that stuff where you can prevent a lot of this from happening from someone pretending to be someone they are not from sending to you or using your domains to send, uh, send things through as well. Um, then the next thing that, you know, generally happens, like there'll be some sort of like legitimate looking link in there, like account-google, which is not owned by Google, or they'll do things like, you know, um, uh, um, what's the, the fancy word? Oh, homoglyphs. So they'll use, like, instead of Microsoft, they'll use RN Microsoft, which, if someone isn't looking very closely, might just look like Microsoft, and they might think it's legit. So people are trained, you know, we, we train users these days to be aware of phishing and know, know how to recognize it, but sometimes it's very easy to just uh, bypass that. And then we have seen these things where people use um, international character sets to use um, uh, the same letters, but at, in a different part of the character set to, uh, which register different, differently, yet in browsers would look the same, and now browsers are kind of like trying to prevent that as well and giving you a warning when someone is using a, uh, a shady uh, domain name that's supposed to look like something else. Um, Credential phishing, so they'll throw up something that looks just like Google, like a login page, and you'll happily type in your credentials because this document that I was just shared with you, you just have to see that. Um, and as of recently, um, we had the uh, awesome uh, Google OAuth uh, worm that went around uh, harvesting everyone's uh, Google OAuth uh, tokens and sent out um, more uh, uh, invitations and sort of it's still a little unclear whether this was someone just kicking the tires, uh, someone letting this out of the lab or what, but um, point being, this was very effective. A million people were affected in, in the course of, you know, who here was affected by that? Or who had to scramble to let their users know or somehow mitigate this? Yeah, so it, it definitely impacted folks. Um, and then there's the, the sort of the drive-by fish where um, you'll get an email that has some sort of like exploit in it, like some, some piece of software that runs automatically depending on the OS you're running that will install various pieces of malware, steal data, et cetera, et cetera, uh, key logging. Um, and then of course the ever popular macro phishing. Um, if you send someone a PowerPoint or Word or Excel thing, they might just open it and run something, and depending on how old the version of Word they, they use, um, this too may uh, put them at risk. Um, still very much a problem. Um, 
you would think that at this point everyone runs the latest of everything, but obviously for all sorts of you know internal reasons, people don't always do that. So still very much a uh, vector. Um, Second vector here, malware, APT, whatever you want to call it, uh, advanced, advanced persistent threats. Um, sort of the, the categories here are, are adware, which we know about. They're mostly annoying. Um, they just insert you know, ads and search res results into your browser. But they may leak data, too, because they're usually not very um, efficiently programmed or very securely programmed. So they might leak data uh, from your browser regardless. Spyware, obviously. Um, as we've seen is, is on the and I'll take these days it will record your screen from your camera, take screenshots, log keys, uh, Excel data, all that fun stuff. Um, ransomware, I think we've gotten a good taste of what ransomware is capable of nowadays. Um, so that is more and more uh, you know, a, uh, a, um, a threat nowadays. And um, it's, it's sort of unfortunate that with the rise of, of cryptocurrency, um, the uh, criminal element runs to this too as a great way to get their money and not get tracked. At the same time, there are then counter offensive that monitor very closely a, a let's say, a Bitcoin coin wallet to see if anyone actually uh, takes money out and sort of tries to trace it back. So, but all of these are just great ways, you know, great um, uh, sort of overlap, you know, in the Venn diagram of bad stuff, you know, good stuff and bad stuff sometimes in the middle, uh, bad stuff uh, comes out. Um, and then anything that's bad, APTs, advanced persistent threats that nestle on, on systems and um, do stuff. Um, we um, are not necessarily um, immune from those. We had uh, recently a, um, a ransomware for Mac called OS X File Coder E. Um, I guess the first four didn't take or were not as powerful. I never know how to, when I see E, it's like what happened to the, it's like the first six ops, what happened to those. Um, so, um, it was uh, bit torrent originated, uh, sort of pa uh, added to a couple of fake cracks or patches for, uh, I think Adobe software, expensive stuff basically. Uh, click here and get you know get free stuff. Um, it was written in Swift, so Joel. <laughs> I pretty much figured it was Joel um, <laughs> before he turned to the to the to the light side, um, and then it didn't work. So that was great. <laughs> Um, in that it was great, it was great at encrypting, but you can actually decrypt your data. So as far as ransomware goes, uh, not the greatest. Um, and at the risk of calling out malware authors for Mac everywhere, uh, they need to step up their game a little bit because a lot of their malware is really sort of like, you know, we have a thing that was written for Linux and we'll change just enough of the API calls to make it work on the Mac, but no guarantees it will actually work. Uh, we'll get to something a little better in a minute, but a lot of this is still sort of like haphazardly, like low, low hanging fruit. If we can get enough people and get some money out of it, it appears to be enough for now. Um, be worried when it gets harder to do this and only the more capable folks start to get into this. We're you know, probably in for uh, a lot more trouble. Um, oops. That was a joke you were supposed to think of. Anyway. So, um, a new uh, fun thing that uh, popped up as of late is um, hijacking of apps. So what am I talking about here? Um, a number of open source apps were uh, breached um, and um, malware authors actually inserted a malware payload into uh, formerly legitimate apps. The first one was a transmission about 2016, uh, second half. Um, their download mirror was breached and um, uh, the uh, folks uh, wanting to get out a breach app were able to upload a newer, newer version of Transmission. Um, and they s actually went to, the, to as far as signing the app, uh, albeit with a different uh, uh, um, developer ID than uh, Transmission is, is usually signed with. If you do any kind of like, uh, who here uses auto package for anything? Some folks, yeah, you do. If you do any kind of like uh, developer uh, or, or code signing checking, it would probably be a great idea to keep some kind of uh, record of what, if something was signed, what was it signed with last time, and maybe compare whether some somehow or uh, um, all of a sudden there's a change in signing uh, certificate, and maybe put that one on hold before you roll it out to everyone. Um, but they did go to the trouble of doing that, um, and it deployed Key Ranger, which is a, a, a keychain. Um, cracking and uh, exfilling app um, that got some pretty good pickup. I think, I want to say less than a week was it out? I believe so. It wasn't that long, but quite a few people use transmission for totally legitimate reasons like downloading Linux ISOs. Um, still, 
well, that's what it's for, right? Yeah. So quite a lot of people were, were um, you know, affected by this and, and a lot of the uh, malware uh, protection uh, uh, folks out there um, went after it quite, uh, quite quickly. This was discussed, actually, I gotta give credit to the security channel on uh, the Mac admin Slack. There was quite a bit of uh, uh, back and forth between some of the, uh, the malware uh, folks in there and the, uh, the Mac admins to kind of like have a concerted effort of figuring out how this, how this thing works and to uh, uh, get rid of it. Um, the most recent one, uh, that one was a, a, pretty, a pretty bad one, uh, was Handbrake. Um, Handbrake um, is a, a video uh, conversion slash uh, uh, transcoding app that folks, well, it used to be to uh, rip all your DVDs. I think these days people use it to, you know, get larger video files so, somehow a little more friendly for downloads and whatnot. Um, so again, same story. The attackers were able to breach the download mirror. Uh, they created an infected app. Um, Handbrake is not signed. I'm not sure why that is. They gave some reasons that it's hard and that it's complicated, which I can understand in some way, like if you have a CI set up, and uh, again, these are open source authors. These are, this is not you know, professionally, well, it's professional. I'm sure they're professionals, but it's not commercially uh, distributed software. Um, I think there was some back and forth actually through some of their GitHub repo and the um, uh, Videoland authors actually said they would take it under their wing and sign it for them. So that actually is a good thing that came out of this. But um, the bigger thing is that it uh, deployed a um, pretty, um, I was just talking about quality of Mac malware, um, Proton B. Uh, Proton was sort of uh, announced with some fanfare as being, speaking of professionally, professionally written Mac malware uh, one-stop shop. So you can uh, pay, a good amount of money for it, set it up, and it was one click Mac malware. It would uh, extract the most amount of data and generally be uh, the best uh, bang for your buck. This was uh, the first one that was out there that was actually like folks were able to analyze it. Um, and it pulls a lot of stuff off a system. It will get the keychain, it will look for password manager, vaults, um, let's see what else. It, it was pretty, uh, pretty uh, extensive in all the data that it would uh, offboard uh, from, the, uh, from the, uh, the endpoint. It was up for about three days, but quite a few people were, were snagged by this um, regardless. And uh, it affected, um, uh, here it is, so it, it is home folder contents. It grabbed the one password fault. For some reason, LastPass was not affected, so maybe they, uh, I'm sure they know about it, but uh, uh, probably had some way, or they thought some way to uh, get a pa one password vaults uh, more easily, browser data as well. So quite a lot of stuff uh, was, uh, was taken away here. Um, the worst thing here is that this sort of has given thought to some domino effect here of um, what happens if one infected app gets in the hands or on the system of another software developer and they get uh, affected. That would never happen, right? Well, it actually did happen with Stephen Frank from uh, Panic. You all know them probably, uh, the authors of Various Tools Coda, um, Transmit, um, uh, um, Prompt for iOS, great app too. Um, he happened to just, he wrote a, a very good blog about it and they were very transparent about what happened here. Um, he downloaded the software, put it on his machine, kind of thought, well, this is weird. It's giving me prompts that it never before, but I'm in a hurry. Let's just go through it, which is pretty much how all of this works um, or what they rely on, uh, folks that uh, put the stuff out there. Um, he got infected. The, um, the authors of the malware got his uh, credentials, among which were a GitHub, um, or I should say GitHub, but some kind of Git credential. And they were able to clone um, a good deal of the panic uh, private repos. Um, they emailed uh, Stephen Frank, said, we got your stuff, and it's ransom time. So um, they decided not to pay. They made the decision that they were not going to pay for various reasons. Um, uh, they, first of all, did not want, uh, you know, sort of to give this, uh, you know, credibility of, like, this is a great way to get uh, to, get to people. Um, they also figured the software at this point, uh, the source that we have is evolving. We're already changing things, and we already have features that are not uh, in the, the, the source they got. At the same time, you know, piracy, I guess, you know, the, the, the attackers could put this out there, but the impact on the bottom line would probably be pretty low. Um, but creating more hijacked apps is obviously a much bigger risk here because once uh, these attackers have this, this uh, the source, they can roll an infected transmit, an infected coda, put it out there on sites where people go for uh, free apps, or they could even sell it. They could do both. They could sell it and infect it, uh, you know, get, get twice, uh, get paid twice. Um, so 
this is where, when you work in DevOps, you really have to worry now because uh, if it's a personal system, obviously it's, it's not any, any better um, um, if you get affected, but when you're doing this on a, on a, um, you know, a, a work machine and you're developing uh, software that, you know, may not be out for many months and there may be trade secrets and all that, if someone gets a hand, uh, hold of that, uh, you're in a lot more trouble, uh, not just from a, you know, legal standpoint, but also, like in this case, someone may use your app to spread malware and it could cost you reputa reputation and basically put you out of business. So this is definitely something that is sort of still new, but um, it, it you know, is concerning if you're in DevOps. Um, go, go on here. Um, so attacks on servers, um, there are some uh, uh, things to worry about too. So anything that's public facing uh, these days, um, obviously you have your web server, you have your d database, SQL or NoSQL services. Uh, your file shares, of course, they're all public, right? or not. Uh, we've seen with the SMBV1, you definitely do not want to have that uh, uh, public, it turns out, like definitely, definitely not. Um, if you go, um, well, I did a, a search on Shodan a while back to see how many SMBV1s were still open. Um, I closed my computer and went for a coffee because it's still not good. Um, and things like public facing DNS, also not a good idea, a former employer who was a higher ed uh, institution, had their DNS public facing for the longest time uh, from a, you know, where academic computing and everything must be open. Um, if you're DOSed on your DNS server, pretty much everything shuts down. So finally, that was put behind some, some kind of a protection. But those are some of the, you know, lower hanging things that you do not want to expose. And then there's network gateways, firewalls that, you know, are supposed to do some of this work, but you want to make sure that they, um, and a vulnerable in any other edge device or any, well, IoT um, as well. Um, so there's a whole bunch of these attack types. What do we got here? This is all OWASP, uh, kind of outlined these. I'm not going to read all these off, but basically accidental discovery. Someone found something while poking around automated malware. There are folks there that will just scan all of the, you know, the non-military IP ranges that will get you, you know, a, a, a a van pulling up uh, out of your, outside of your house pretty quickly. But other than that, scanning for vulnerabilities. Curious attackers, some folks are just interesting, uh, interested in uh, whether something is going on or whether they can get into your uh, system. Um, script kiddies, um, sort of a, a term for uh, the, um, I don't know, uh, it is what it is. Um, just sort of common renegades seeking to compromise their face. You know, basically people looking to make noise uh, more so than financial or any other gain. Motivator attacker, you know, there's someone who really uh, has, has a goal here. Organized crime, uh, obviously uh, uh, looking for financial gain or, or some other gain. Um, so external facing, uh, let's talk a little bit about what we have here. So we got, you know, we have a lot of cloud hosted, as I touched on before, cloud host, hosted instances of, of things out there. And they're usually very essential to, uh, to what we do. Um, so what do we got here? Um, Source control again, you know, if you use any of these services, GitHub, GitLab, Travis, um, if someone gets your credentials um, and you are not using something like a multi-factor or, you know, a security key or, or some kind of uh, second factor, uh, it, it's very easy to get into that. So um, you want to be very aware that you do not um, sort of get lax on, uh, on, on security there, especially when it comes to your credentials. Um, deploying anything, AWS, GCP, DigitalOcean, Heroku, um, they all require auth, and again, it is easy to either mess up or kind of like not do the best practices and just enough to get it running. Um, and then common mistakes are, you know, storing credentials for the code that you need later in your, in your source. Um, there are various projects out there that will actually scan something like GitHub for credentials, and um, just recently I came, came across one called a truffle hog. Um, that um, uses, uh, it's a little smarter, it looks for specific types of like entropy or like uh, random, random enough data that it might be some kind of key that someone generated and it uh, will trawl through GitHub, let's say, and find any kind of like uh, possibly um, accidentally uh, committed uh, credentials. So you gotta be careful with that because if, if someone is, is dedicated enough to write an automated tool to find it, someone who's looking for specifics for your org will definitely uh, go, go looking for that. Um, so what else we got? Some other common services. Um, you know, we got all of our database slash SQL systems more and more. They will be out there in the cloud somewhere, clustered in some way. So lots of data going around, uh, sitting out in the cloud. Um, 
NoSQL, so we got Redis, Mongo, CouchDB, um, you name it, all those you know, uh, sort of key value store type things, very popular these days. Um, and then any of the containerization tools out there, again, lots of cloud hosted stuff. Again, all involve credentials that you do not want to, uh, to get, uh, get out there. Um, so an interesting um, bit of research in a talk, um, one of my coworkers, Jordan Wright, did. Um, he went out and scanned uh, the internet for exposed NoSQL or key value hosts that had either no credentials or, or default credentials. Um, and he found that, um, sort of this is a spread of like Memcached, Redis, Mongo, Elasticsearch, uh, exposed hosts out there on the internet at the time, um, about nine months ago or so, um, that were all vulnerable to some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, basically uh, weak off attack. Um, and it's kind of worrisome because those stores are used for a lot of data that you don't want to expose. There are banks storing uh, transaction records in there. Uh, healthcare storing data in there. A lot of these NoSQL stores are, 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 are tend to be like runtime. Um, 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 uh, they are at some point flushed to a database, but they are live, and a lot of times that data is very fresh. And if you don't set up your dumping to cache uh, to disk in some way, it may all live there forever and ever and ever, uh, being readily accessible. Um, so one of those uh, attacks against Redis uh, involved a. Um, a remote uh, vulnerability that uh, was fake ransomware. Speaking of ransomware, this one was uh, not uh, dysfunctional, it was uh, fake. How it works, worked was that it went after Redis instances that were, had no auth. Um, it would then um, wipe uh, on disk data store. So Redis can cache data to disk. It's usually in memory, but if you have a lot of data going through, you might want to dump that to disk every so often to make it, uh, you know, not eat up all the memory. So uh, you can create a on-disk data store. So first thing it did, it, it wiped that. Again, there was no auth, so whoever walked in could do whatever they wanted with any of the commands in Redis. Um, then it creates a, uh, a new key in the database that uh, contains the attacker's uh, public SSH key. So a record uh, in memory at this point. Um, next thing they did was change the data store to uh, slash root dot SSH. Um, and you can probably kind of see where this is going. Um, it then renames the data store to, sorry, this is the directory, root uh, slash dot SSH, and then it uh, renamed the actual file to authorized keys. And um, the way that the data is stored by Redis is basically uh, compatible with the SSH, uh, SSHD uh, way of looking up what keys are allowed to log in to a host. So at this point, we've now created, through a roundabout way, a valid authorized keys uh, file for a root SSH that contains the attacker's public uh, SSH key. And um, they could basically now uh, lock this uh, instance down, uh, which is what they did. Um, they would, I'm sorry, they would um, uh, lock it down, put a password on it, and put up a notice that said, your data has been ransomed and you need to pay us. They just flushed the database and there was no data left. So whoever paid them got nothing. Um, so it was sort of like lazy ransomware. But at the same time, you can see how you might think like, well, I don't have a password on it or I have to default, what, what could go wrong? Someone who wants to do something harmful has way better ideas than you. They're way more dedicated to this and they will find ways like getting a public key on the system in a file that SSH will read. So you don't want to skimp on this. Um, another recent one was uh, Hadoop is another uh, a, a popular uh, tool out there uh, related to caching and others. Um, someone at Shodan did some research and uh, when, you, when you work at Children, you get all the, the really good data, data I'm sure. Um, so they, they scan their databases to see how much of um, Hadoop has a file system that, uh, that goes with, with, with uh, how the system works. Um, and they found that over five petabytes of data was exposed on the internet, so uh, uh, publicly accessible in some way. And um, uh, what that means is, is very, you know, it's, it's easy to set up, people will spin it up and forget about it, um, but five petabytes out there that possibly if you were running some major attack and you needed to store data somewhere decentralized, you could get sort of like an, a, a, a cloud raid set up where you spread, shard data out over, well, you got five petabytes to play with, so 
um, shard it out over a whole bunch of instances all around the world, basically, and start writing data out at you know incredible speeds, obviously. Um, but you can really, if you want to do data obfuscation or, or store data decentral uh, in some decentral way, this will be a great way to do it. Uh, again, easy to set up incorrectly if you do it wrong or go with the with the defaults. Um, to a lot of the uh, projects credits these days, they give you warnings or make the defaults a lot less easy to compromise. But at the same time, they have to strike a balance between getting people into it and starting to use it versus, like, like uh, Victor said, dealing with um, TLS for four days and then finally just uh, not going through with it because it's just too much work. So it's, it's a tough balance to, uh, to strike. Um, and again, th that data was also ransomed uh, in, in, in similar ways. Um, Let's look at some internal systems. Um, who here uses VPN in some way to get the systems that they need to get to externally? Quite a few folks, a lot of folks, okay. So a common problem with giving VPN access to networks that have some systems on, on there that a DevOps user may need to get to is that the VPN has much too broad access. So uh, VPN, VPNing into the system basically means you are on the, work, uh, on, on the corporate network as if you were there. So, you may just need to get to the Git server or whatever, or you need to push something to fab and that's it. But an attacker who might find a way to get your credentials or otherwise hop on your connection now has full pivot to anything else on the network and, go, and can freely go look around and see what else is out there that has nothing to do with what you're currently working on, but um, may find, let's say, a vulnerable SMB server that is only uh, internally accessible, yet VPN in a, a, a too loosely set up st a state may allow that to, uh, to happen. So some things to consider, if you use VPN, do you use just one, one auth? Here, who here uses, and I'm not asking this out of any self-interest, but here, who here uses MFA with their VPN? Okay, so a subset of those folks that are using VPN, but a good deal. That is a, a good first step because an attacker that may uh, want to piggyback on your connection or use your credentials in some way uh, is gonna have a, a harder time. Um, this may not necessarily be something for a DevOps um, a person to know themselves directly, but it's definitely a question you should ask your, your network folks. Do we have visibility of everything that is exposed to our VPN? Um, do we have a separate subnet where just development systems is prod entirely uh, air-gapped in some way? Can someone pivot on there? Because the lengths uh, attackers will go through to get to your prod network uh, can be quite extensive. Uh, I'm sure some here in the room have some experience of what attackers will go through to get to, uh, to prod. Um, and you're given network level access, so like I said, uh, anyone attacking could, could pivot and uh, find, other, uh, find other interesting bits to, uh, to nestle in the, in the network. And if you have contractors, do they have the same rights or are they, are they constricted in some way of what they can actually access? Do they have a time limit? If a contractor walks away from the machine and someone else nestles on their computer to do God knows what, is there a time limit? Uh, do you limit them to a certain amount of hours continuously or per week or whatever else? These are all important things to, uh, to consider when you give outside uh, access uh, to non, you know, first party um, uh, developers. Um, SSH, um, I really hope that everyone here uses some kind of PKI, some kind of key to do SSH. Yes, I'll just assume. Um, you don't really, you really don't wanna just use password auth. That's, that's that, don't, let's, let's not do that. Um, but some other questions you need to ask, how are, the, how are the keys stored? Are they just laying around on disk? Again, if you get some kind of malware on there that starts exfilling, let's say your home folder, your public key will make it somewhere and um, someone who might want to, let's say, get to your Git repo that is over SSH might get your source. Um, so where are those keys stored? Um, you might want to consider hardware-backed keys. So use a YubiKey or some el something else. YubiKeys are the easiest to use these days. Um, who here happens to use a hardware key for SSH? Nice, cool. All right, the Google folks, I hope to see hands. <laughs> so definitely um, you want to use some kind of ha hardware-backed keys. How that works is you have a tiny, I don't have mine with me, well, somewhere. Anyway, tiny little key, put in a USB port. Uh, it has, instead of having the keys on your physical disk, it's stored on the, um, on the key, and it uses a, a communication protocol to actually get the key securely in and out of the uh, SSH agent. Um, you actually can set it to, to require a touch, so physical presence, so it doesn't just send it when it, it requires it. You actually have to tap it and say, this is me logging in, go ahead and give the key. Um, as far as that goes, 
Um, you might want to use some kind of 2FA just in, just in case instead of, you know, storing the key on, uh, on a hardware token is not a second factor. It's just your first factor is more, stored more securely. You might want to layer some kind of second factor on top of that, um, um, not necessarily to make your life harder, but to uh, uh, make it harder for attackers. Um, and again, uh, if you want to kind of cover that part, can users that uh, are on SSH, are they able to hop to other hosts? Can folks get there, uh, get to systems that they're not supposed to? Even if you wouldn't, could someone else get somewhere else? And uh, of course, if you have SSH users on a remote system, can they YOLO things? Like, let's say you let Sam on your systems. Can he do things that, hi Sam. Um, so let's see what else we got here. So um, DevOps user, we see a pretty big attack service here, right? There's all, way, all sorts of ways that you have, you know, you have some sort of keys to something or credentials to something that might possibly be very bad if someone gets to that. Um, so they have quite a lot of credentials to quite a lot of important systems. Um, they might just have more access than they, than they need to have. Um, you might also not know everything that your credentials can possibly do. Maybe something you can do you don't, you're not even aware of, but someone who's interested in getting inside may f care to figure that out and use that access to, uh, again, uh, do bad things. Uh, security hygiene, I love that word. Um, having imperfect security hygiene basically um, not following all the rules that you know you should uh, follow. Um, this goes all every way. It goes from network admins to sysadmins to DevOps users. Everyone sort of needs to do their best to, um, to uh, uh, con contribute to sort of what I like to call security herd Im immunity. If everyone does a certain level of, of best practices, the, the immunity of the whole organization is much stronger than if there's a few people who are doing their job, but then a lot of people or a smaller group is not doing it they may affect everyone uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, larger than you would expect. Um, and everyone's vulnerable to phishing. Um, I'm sure we've all gotten some fish uh, by email that at first glance looked, oh, I wonder what he wants. And then you hover and you're like, oh, no, wait, hold on. Let's not do that. Um, phishing continues to, to evolve and get more and more um, um, uh, 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 capable uh, at what they're doing. So you definitely want to uh, stay on top of that. And, you know, password reuse and weak passwords, bad times. Uh, don't reuse any passwords and um, weak passwords also, uh, no bueno. Um, you know, if you use shared secrets for any reason, make sure you do it in somewhat of a uh, secure way. Use, you know, uh, secure notes, like I know uh, LastPass has like a secure notes uh, method. There's other dedicated systems that you can spin up that will store secrets that you can check out using an API key or some other uh, detached way. Um, if those credentials are compromised, uh, it's game over, anyone can get to it. Um, you can get, you know, potentially admin access on other systems. Um, an example I like to give, uh, Palantir, security company, did a red team exercise where they had uh, basically hired help to uh, attack their own, um, their own uh, uh, premises or, or systems, and they gain access to their wiki where they store lots of interesting stuff, including their Jamf admin credentials. Um, and I'm sure you can see where this one's going. Um, the attackers were then able to uh, add a rogue payload and get it uh, installed uh, specifically on a subset of admin users that they were interested in. Sort of that was the target of getting to them. And at that point, game over. They had, you know, once you can install something with, with Jamf, you can install any kind of root privileged application. Uh, and game over. So again, very important. If you do shared secrets, uh, protect them with your life. Um, I've shown this a lot, but I like this one very much. Um, sort of the, what, what different groups of uh, users think is important in security. So um, non-experts, uh, you know, everyday users think that using antivirus software is still number one. Um, they do know that using strong passwords is important. Um, changing passwords frequently, uh, number three there. Uh, only visit web websites, you know, and don't share personal information. That's the distilled top five of, you know, your average user's understanding of, of how security practices work. Security experts, um, and I think all, we all here know in some capacity that installing your updates, your patches is sort of the number one. I mean, I think we all have a lot of infrastructure around just that thing, getting, uh, getting uh, patches out there uh, as quick as possible. Using unique passwords, don't use the same password twice. Um, use some kind of two-factor, multi-factor authentication, 
using strong passwords, uh, generate one, store it in your password manager, don't even attempt to memorize it, just let your password manager ha handle it. And then number five, use a password manager. I think DevOps users, same way, if you follow these five, um, you are you know, a much, uh, much stronger security user and a much uh, smaller target for those who may wish to uh, go through you to get to uh, uh, more interesting bits uh, at your company. Um, so let's talk solution. How am I on time? Probably running over, right? Running, right, running over. over. Sorry, I'll wrap it up. Um, so not the solution, cycling passwords. Every month, weekday, cycle your certs instead. Um, use uh, Let's Encrypt to do that. Um, add even more antivirus, right? Like as long as we have enough layered antivirus, everything will be fine. That's probably not the case. Um, and use more MDM because MDM uh, implies security, also not. It can help you to do other things like uh, impose security practices, but in general, just adding it as a checkbox, now we're secure is definitely not the case. Um, solutions, don't expect services that don't need it. Like we said, review uh, VPN access policies, leave no default configuration unchecked um, on your NoSQL deployment tools, et cetera. Don't just click the button and, and assume it's okay. It might not be. Use 2FA where possible, and U2F is best. Um, I had a little video, but I won't play it because we are running over time. But please don't use SMS for 2FA anymore if you can. SMS is at this point deprecated security-wise. It's too easy to get someone's phone ported or get access to a phone number and receive SMS messages. That, um, that is not a, a good idea. Um, I will not play this. I will go right through that. If you need a link, uh, it's a little, what is U2F? Um, Use PKI for SSH, store it on a security key, um, and use, wow, talk about bearing the lead. Um, anyway, I'm giving a talk somewhere in the summer about Beyond Core, so I won't bother you with it, but um, if you want to read up on Beyond Core, I'll leave this, read up on Beyond Core. It may very well um, uh, sort of transform your security practices, um, but it's basically not about the person, it's about uh, it, trust no network, um, uh, figure out whether the, the, the device and the, the user is somehow uh, authorized, et cetera, et cetera. Read about this. Uh, this is too much of a topic to go into now. Um, if you're coming to PSU Mac, I'm giving a whole talk about nothing but Beyond Core for Mac admin, so um, you can learn all about that. And um, so, like I said, herd immunity. If everyone does their job, um, the system is a lot better. Perfect systems, lacks humans, uh, leads to bad, bad times. Um, I have more conclusions, yes. <laughs> anyway, make it a lot harder to be breached. Phishing means lazy works. Um, like I said, O days only for, for really big orgs or really uh, targeted ones. Implement the top five security practices. Be 99% more secure than you are now. And that is it. Thank you.